Video coverage of the 27th JCT Traffic Signal Symposium is brought to you by Highways News. Thanks to our sponsors, AGD Intelligent Traffic Systems, Clearview Intelligence, PTV Group, Message Maker Displays, Smart Video and Sensing, SRL and TRL. Okay. Um, morning. I uh, hope everyone's feeling fine and dandy this morning. Um, so uh, this morning, Jenny and I are going to talk about five second minimum green. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the potential benefits we identified and why we wanted to go with the trial. Talk a little bit about the trial itself uh, and some of the uh, initial outcomes and findings we had. Um, so I wanted to put it in context uh, of the wider Transport for London strategy um, and London's strategy. So the Mayor's Transport strategy is a big focus on healthy streets. So really focus on uh, de de delivering an active, efficient, uh, safe, sustainable modes around London. Um, and part of our role as network performance managers is to ensure that the traffic signals operate in this way to benefit sustainable modes. Uh, and deliver the best possibilities in London. So the five second minimum green, which we'll talk about, uh, aligns with this and is kind of why we, we, we found it interesting and wanted to pursue it. So uh, Jenny's certainly the expert in this, so she'll talk about it in a second. But the, uh, the five second minimum green, so our traffic signals and our signal timings are dictated. A lot of what we can, can and can't do is dictated by traffic control engineering, uh, which Jenny's part of, who obviously use the regulations and guidance out there, um, which dictate what we can and can't do with traffic lights. One of these being the minimum amount of green time we're allowed to give to a traffic approach. Oh, good, it's kept on going. Um, so previously it was seven, but in 2019, a change to the traffic uh, signs manual, chapter six, specified that the shortest minimum green period normally used for traffic phase is seven. However, at sites with very low flows, a minimum of five seconds can be used with caution. So this was a big change uh, and something that we thought there may be benefits, so we wanted to um, pursue. So a couple of little benefits that we thought we might get out of it, which is why we wanted to invest some time and effort into it. Um, basically, is we think it will develop, develop, uh, deliver benefits for primarily two sustainable modes, uh, namely buses and pedestrians. Now, obviously, changing the minimum green from seven to five will, on occasion, give us an extra two seconds to optimize. The junction will get two seconds back to reallocate time. Um, and in our, in our thoughts, we were like, well, this could either go to a bus stage, so give more time for buses progressing through the junction, which is, would be excellent to help bus performance, or it could take it away from the cycle time and therefore reduce pedestrian wait time. So those were the two key areas that we thought we might be able to uh, deliver a benefit for. Um, so when we thought this, we said, off to engineering, can you tell us what we need to do? So, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so when we were posed this question of going it back, I want to take everyone back to that chapter six sentence. So it's sites with very low flows, a minimum of five seconds may be used with caution. So from an engineering perspective, there are two things that kind of point out there. The first one is, what is very low flows? And the second one is, what with caution? <laughs> so it's quite a, um, we're used to, as an engineer, you want like really rigid areas, and this wasn't one. So. I just asked myself the typical engineering question, which is, if I do this, what could go wrong? And the first thing that the question is, um, could the safety critical timings become inefficient? So if you've ever trained anyone new to the industry and had to try and explain to them why the intergreen times are the way they are, you might do what I do, which is just that some people in the 1960s thought these were probably right, but validate them when you're commissioning them. Um, so. This is the same with the min green as well. So uh, thankfully, um, um, Dr. Mark Pladel dug it out of his PTC archive, but this is actually a, uh, a book from 1967, which declared that the five second figure, although theoretically justified, doesn't seem to be done under any kind of formal calculation. But obviously, stuff has moved on since then. So if you think about acceleration or what, how fast vehicles need to move now, you could justify it could be lower, but we don't really know why. So when you're changing any of these basic building blocks of traffic signal design, you run into this kind of knock-on problem of like, if I change this, am I suddenly making this inefficient and all of these statements? So it's just a thing we need to investigate. So the question's still unknown. So this is one of our investigation points. So we translated that unknown into a condition that needs to be met. So we need to make sure that minimum green time is a duration long enough so that all the additional safety critical timing still work. The second one is, would all the traffic signal equipment work? 
so we've got a lot of old equipment out there. That's actually not that old, but this was some sites that I went to recently, snaps and photos. But we've got a lot of stuff on our network and some of it which is obsolete. So we've got over 6,500 traffic signals out there, and that was a conservative figure like at least 10 years ago now, so we've probably got more. Um, and we also have a bunch of vehicle detectors. So we've got the old Ames IRDs and we've got some new AGDs. So will all of that function? with a five second minimum green. Obviously, if you're giving extensions on vehicle detectors, they need to be able to get to a speed before they can detect for the extension. So again, we've got two conditions now coming out of that, which is will the, will the controllers work, will the detectors work? The unknown three, this is the tricky one. Will the traffic signal remain credible? So in a perfect world, in a network world maybe, <laughs> we'll be able to flash up the green for like a second and drivers will be like, cool, and just go and not worry. But we know that's not the way that drivers behave. They'll start not trusting the signals and violating tactfully because they think they're not working. Um, so we don't know whether that difference from seven seconds to five seconds will result in drivers you know, no longer trusting them. So that's our last condition. Uh, we needed to evaluate that. So we've talked a lot about with caution. <laughs> Let's talk about low flows. So we don't know what low flows are. We don't know whether that's a low flow for London, whether it's a low flow for the junction, whether that's a low flow for the area, whether that's a low flow for the UK. So we would have to investigate that as part of our trial. What's TFL's idea of what low flows are? So we've got a pretty good skeleton of a trial now. We've got some conditions that we need to investigate. Um, so we decided to do some on-street trials, uh, which um, hopefully would lead to us being able to build a characterization, of a, a characterization of a site where five seconds would work. Yeah, I'm gonna jump on for two slides. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about the trial sites we selected. So um, we chose 12 sites across London. Uh, we used uh, uh, our own uh, site knowledge within our department to choose these sites. Um, and they had a variety of different characterizations uh, and characteristics that we wanted to test. Uh, so we got a nice idea from our first phase of a trial. Um, what we did want to know is roughly when we think uh, sites might run down to five seconds, because obviously this is only a change to the minimum green, not a change to the maximum green. Obviously, if our sites are running skewed, they can still optimize up, etc. So uh, we divide it into four categories, which you can see here. I won't bother reading to you. Um, but obviously, we wanted to see whether there was going to be a benefit for sustainable modes. So all of these had bus routes traveling through them, and they all had pedestrian facilities. Um, and very quickly, early on in the trial, when we, when we were really still going through it, we were quite, uh, quite quickly able to identify that there's also a grouping. So that we would pick them based on categories, but we were also able to group them, which is uh, what engineering have used to basically do their analysis, the different groups of signals. Um, and these are the four, the four uh, groupings. So cycle phases, uh, ultra low uh, flows, so this is exits from private uh, estates, basically. Uh, very low flows, so where it's a very, very low flow, so a couple of vehicles. Um, and then other, and others are a much bigger category and something we need to investigate further, as Jenny may touch upon, on a, on a second phase and a third phase of a trial. But that was a categorization. There's loads more of information about it in the paper if you really want to read that. Thank you. Right, thank you. I hope it's working again. Okay, so when we've picked these sites and we need to test our conditions, we decided how we were going to capture that data. So for the first three conditions, awesome, they're the easiest ones. So it's going to be on site observation. So all of our engineers always attend what we call a commissioning or a local acceptance test to see how the design you know, is affecting the road network. So in terms of clearance time, detection for extension, the traffic signal controller, we could do that on site observation. The trickier one was signal credibility. So we couldn't stop drivers and say, do you still view this signal as credible? I don't think they, we would got much a good response. So we made the kind of um, statement that we would do before and after surveys on uh, red light violations and see whether there was any kind of percentage increase on red light violations. And we'd have to draw the conclusion that if there was an increase, it was due to this lack of credibility. Now, that's a statement that I say, knowing that that's not necessarily, that's kind of causation correlation. So but it was the best shot that we kind of had at the point. And the next one was very low flows. So because we weren't testing against anything, because the DFT hadn't said very low flows is this, um, we kind of made the assumption that, well, if the flow wasn't, if the flow was too high, then people would start right about violating. That's 
an, an assumption. So again, we did before and after surveys on red light violations, but we also took counts so we could see like whether there was, you know, at this point, we would start getting a high red light violation. So this is an example of the kind of documents we used to capture. So we built these ob site observation reports, which um, we asked uh, the engineers who went out to commission these sites to fill out. And we also uh, set out a, a, a survey very detailed survey document which explained to the survey company exactly what we wanted and putting effort into these two parts was really important for us and it's a good lesson um, to make sure that you, you know you don't want to be going back to people and going oh can we have this extra information so this is the results so it's a nice little results table there's more information in the report if you want to read it but essentially for group one oh well, hang on <laughs> sorry we'll do it by conditions so for condition one, which is clearance time, it was met for groups one, two, and three. It wasn't met for one site in group four. Um, but we don't think this was because the intergreen times became inefficient. We think it's just because the junction had a severe blocking problem, so we couldn't see vehicles pass through. So it, it's worth a lesson that because we didn't see it, we cannot conclusively say that the condition wasn't met, which is if anyone does any kind of um, trials or stuff, you know, this is a frustrating condition because you kind of want to come back and go, no, that's, but it's not for that reason. But to err on the side of caution and safety, you have to say it hasn't been met. But we can see it was met for cycles ultra low and ultra low and very low public highway. The second one's detections for extensions, and this is where I give a big thumbs up to Topaz. <laughs> so uh, all the sites that we used uh, did, for f the detection worked fine, but we did notice that a lot of these sites didn't have detection anyway for extensions, which is kind of what you would expect for low flow sites. Um, you wouldn't put up an extension because you'd assume that they'd be able to clear in the min. Um, and just to kind of bolster that, the current TFL equipment standards uh, state that your detector has to meet Topaz 2505A, which has that statement in it, which makes us happy, basically, that they'll definitely be able to detect low-speed vehicles. The next one is signal credibility. So for this one, we didn't meet it in group three and group four, but we did meet it in group one and group two. So again, this, the, this was due to the red light violation increases. We couldn't say that it was specifically because five seconds is suddenly non credible. But we don't have the evidence to not say it isn't. <laughs> so we had to say that they didn't meet the condition. And the next one is uh, traffic signal controllers, so very similar. Um, meeting Topaz means that we're confident that the signal working value will be sufficient. And for the very low flows, that condition, this was the tricky one. This is where we've got some questions. So all of, the, all of pedal cycles were able to discharge under five seconds, regardless of how many pedal cycles we observed. So and the reason for that is obviously pedal cycles don't line up like that. They line up like this. They use the whole step line. They go off at a fair clip. Um, so is there a pedal cycle flow which could be considered high? That's a question. <laughs> Um, for group three, we saw this like kind of, um, uh, I can't remember what it is, like rule of thumb perfect point, which is that if you have three vehicles in a lane, they are all able to discharge under five seconds, but any more than that, and they start getting trapped. So we had a big a, a head scratcher trying to work out, is three vehicles per lane per cycle a good rule of thumb? It's a question. In group four, we noticed that one of the sites didn't ever optimize to five seconds. Um, and we realized later that that was because it was originally picked because it could over op uh, optimize overnight, but we didn't test it overnight. So there was a question there of like, well, if the low flows are overnight, is that okay to drop to five? Go back to you, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just wanted to briefly run over um, some of the initial results we had from a, from a signal perspective, because obviously we talked about what theoretical benefits we thought we might be able to deliver. We wanted to see whether we think after the trial that it's going to potentially deliver those benefits. Um, so on the right-hand side, you can see, uh, yeah, so you can see basically uh, signal timings. Um, and this was uh, quite rudimental because in order to do our proper sustainable benefits measurements, which we use for all our signal timing reviews, we need a long after period, probably two weeks to do a before and after comparison, and you get bus journey times, et cetera, et cetera. However, because it's not been, we haven't signed off this as, as safe, et cetera, by engineering at this stage, uh, we weren't able to leave it to run for a long time. So we only actually had two days of after data, which were the two trial days. So it was a weekend day and a weekday that we did the trial. So it's only got two days 
decades' worth of data. So, um, uh, but what we were able to do was uh, look at sites which previously only, in the before, only ever ran seven seconds. So there was no uh, optimization upping the green. So they're always seven. Afterwards, these were the sites that always ran five. So very rudimentally, we were able to work out how many times these stages came in. They, every time they saved two seconds, and therefore this was the time we got back to the junction, which was no longer being used on the quiet, very low flows. Um, so you can see it ranged between one minute and 11 and a half minutes. So great, at these sites, we could give that time back to buses, progress buses, um, and obviously we'll do that analysis when we can. Um, the one on the right-hand side uh, is uh, the cycle time. So obviously with Scoot, cycle time has um, Oh, a red light, okay. It uh, has a threshold, so it's uh, four or eight seconds increments. Obviously, if you take away two seconds from the cycle time, you may actually benefit more than two seconds because it takes you below that threshold. So at three of the sites, we'd actually save four seconds in cycle time, and three of the sites, we'd actually save eight seconds. So a two-second saving is actually delivering an eight-second benefit. Uh, and we've only got two slides, so we'll be very quick. We've gone red, which is ironic. Um, uh, so yeah, so we've... We approve for business as usual five second minimum green uh, for certain groups, so those ones where any pedal cycle which runs exclusively in its own stage and any phase with ultra low flow, so one to two vehicles per hour is basically how we're defining ultra low. Um, we've said that possibly we could approve it on a site for site basis for other phases, um, but we still have this question about low flow. Is this 500 vehicles per day? Is this three vehicles per lane per cycle? Still the questions are always there. Um, so we've designed a phase two trial with the initial study parameters you can see here, but you can also read about it in the document if you want to. Uh, and network opportunities. <laughs> Yeah, uh, really quickly, uh, network opportunity. So obviously, hopefully we've demonstrated, sorry, hopefully we've demonstrated that there is a potential benefit for us um, by lowering this minimum green from seven to five. Uh, and obviously, we really want to progress this further and take further trials to see, see where we can implement it. So we are looking at doing that. We are looking at future trials. We are looking at future sites. Um, and there is an opportunity here to really deliver a benefit um, through quite a simple, simple change. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Perfect, any questions? Right, we've only got a couple of minutes, so we'll quickly uh, look for questions. Uh, have a guess who's got his hand up to ask a question. Um, Lord Playdell, we'll get a microphone <laughs> to you. Um, and so what I should basically say is, after Mark, who else would like to ask a question? Put your hand up and we'll, we'll get, if we can get a mic down the front as well, but Mark. Thanks, <coughs> Chris, Jen. Nice paper, thank you. Um, I've actually got several, but I'm going to stick to one, Paul, rest assured. Um, red light violation is a safety test. Did you look at how long after the end of the green that violation was occurring? Because with the shorter green, obviously, were they violating later compared with the violation level you got on a seven second min? Yeah, so uh, we, that was part of the thing that we said. We said, like, are you red, is this a red light violation really fully after the cycle? Is this a red light violation immediately after? Is this leaving AMA running? We also captured that. Is this, um, is this also positioning themselves because they want to overrun the ASL, that kind of thing? Um, so yeah, we did collect all of that data. Um, so we did do some kind of site where every single site where Korak Van Tool, if anyone knows him, he basically just sat down, looked at the video, and just went like, okay, I think they were doing it for that reason. Um, we, we can't make assumptions that the reason why people are violating are, but it seems to be frustration. So it is a matter of, I don't think I'm gonna get enough time, so I'm going to violate it. And also sometimes tactful violation as well. So they know that there is nothing there, so they'll go. So yes, <laughs> in the short answer. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Uh, Lyndon. Uh, mine's basically about the de detection at the stop lines, et cetera. Most of ours, the stop lines we don't extend. Mm. So if if we're looking at the X loop as the first point of change of state, five seconds, you're not going to be pulling off the X loop or, or, or to, toggling it uh, before he's gone but back to green. Did he do anything to the stop line de de detection to make it extend? So for in London, we tend to not have um, exit loops. Like there's a mover, is that mover? Yeah, there's a, London's very anti-mover. <laughs> um, we have very barely any mover sites. We didn't test any mover sites, but that is something which we'll look at in the second part of the trial to see whether there are those affected. At, uh, our stop line detection tends to be IRDs or video cameras for the detection, and for the extension, it's a MVD, SMVD, 
a video detector at this point, but yeah. So we didn't do any testing, no, is the answer to that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> any more? Yeah, one more just. Uh, Tom Siddle, four way. This is much an observation, just following on from the last point, with uh, on another site, run five second, minimum green on mover. And uh, mover did precisely what it should do, calculating its variable minimum, clearing traffic off, extending green nicely, and sitting down on five seconds when it was just the normal, typical one or two vehicles coming out of the site. So it, it certainly yeah, it backs up what we saw with a, a lot more science than what we've done. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, it works very well with Mover as well. Perfect. Yeah, as, uh, as Jenny said, obviously we don't have a huge number of Mover, if if any, really. So it's we just we, we tested what with what we had, and we want to do more tests. So hopefully we'll have more information about other sites and other criteria in future. Yeah, just yeah. for the for the audience. So I yeah. think it, yeah, it it's cracking. This is a little way just to save that little bit of efficiency all the time. Brilliant. Thank you both. That was fascinating. Um, that's great. Thanks very much. A big round of applause.